Welcome back. I hope you all had a good lunch. Maybe had a chance to see some of the Arboretum. There was a bunch of surprising number of geese out today. Usually there aren't that many geese. Lots of ducks. There's some good ducklings out there if you didn't see the ducklings right now. Anyway, um, OK, so welcome back. I'm personally looking forward to the coffee that should be arriving in the next hour or so. We'll get some coffee. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to, we're pushing things back a little bit, but I don't think we're going to end late or anything today. I think there's plenty of time to get through everything. Ayaz is going to talk about um, the CPU models, which he's going to talk about a little bit about how to use them today. And then tomorrow afternoon, going to go into deep detail as to how to add new instructions and all, this, all, all sorts of details about how the CPU models actually work under the hood. But today, we're just going to talk a little bit about how to use them. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Miriam after that, who's going to talk about doing full system simulation. And then Kalstoff, who's going to talk about accelerating simulation. So I think we'll have plenty of time this afternoon for some interactive coding sessions. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. OK, Ayaz, turn it over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ayaz. Before we start, I just want to make sure all of you have um, the slides open so that if, if you can't see here, at least you can follow. And um, it, it'll be good if you have the code spaces set up uh, open as well so that once we have to do some real interactive stuff, you can uh, like start doing that as soon as possible. OK, so what we're going to do in this session is that we'll uh, first briefly talk about what are um, different kind of CPU models that are supported in Gem5 today. Uh, we'll cover some background, and then we'll go to um, how to really use that or those CPU models. And finally, we'll look at some um, of the statistics that are generated once you run those CPU models to basically try to understand what are the differences of those CPU models that um, we're going to be talking about right now. So first, let's go um, to the background of the CPU models. Um, it's probably not going to be an exhaustive list of CPU models, but we're going to cover the most important ones. Uh, and here's really a summary of the, uh, of the CPU models. Again, at this point, you might not understand all the differences. We'll look at some of the details of some of the models, and then we'll see how do they really differ in terms of the characteristics they have. But at this point, I just want to give you a quick glance of you know, like what's the overall space of CPU models. So we have in Gem5 base CPU, which then can be inherited. And uh, we have, I would say, three basic classes or three main classes. There's base KVM CPU, which based on which we have ARM KVM CPU and x86 KVM CPU. Uh, the base simple CPU then gives you timing simple CPU and atomic simple CPU. Again, we'll see what exactly those are. Uh, and two of the more detailed CPU models are uh, O3 CPU and minor CPU. OK, so let's first jump into the simple CPU models. Um, in, at a high level, they are basically functional in our single cycle CPU models. Uh, not very detailed, but very fast. Uh, but before you really understand what are the differences between atomics, uh, time, atomic simple CPU and timing simple CPU models, uh, I think you should be able to uh, know the difference between different kind of memory types that are supported in Gem5. So primarily, there are three types, atomic, functional, and timing. So atomic memory access type is basically um, doesn't really model any timing. It's, it's very, it, as the name suggests, it's atomic. So if a requester sends a request, let's say, to the memory subsystem, um, as shown on the top right of the slide, over the time axis, let's say a there's a request function which is called. Uh, basically, the, the request eventually in, in the same call of functions or same sequence of function calls would return back with the response and with some approximate timing. Okay, so all, everything is happening in the, in one function call sequence. Uh, 
Uh, and usually this approximate timing is basically returned by the, the memory system objects that are modeled. They will give you, they will not model any contention, they will not model any kind of um, really the, the queuing delays, but will give you some approximate time. Uh, in contrast to the atomic memory access type, the, the very diff, I, I would say, totally on the opposite axis of, the, uh, of your speed and accuracy trade-off, we have timing memory access types, which are very detailed um, and usually modeled as split transactions. So as you can see in the bottom right of the slide, let's say at some point in time there is a requester which through some request function sends a request. Usually that eventually would lead to some function in the future being scheduled and there might be many functions or events that are scheduled depending on what kind of memory system you're modeling. And finally, at some time, we don't know what exactly that time would be, but at some time there will be some response function which will be called and at that point we'll really get the response back. Uh, and this is the, mod, the memory access type which really models uh, the queuing delay, the resource contention, and you can think of the, the most detailed memory um, modeling in Gem5 that exists today. Uh, and kind of basically, uh, independent of these two models, we have functional timing or functional memory accesses as well, which really is a debug interface uh, and usually allows your backdoor access to the memory itself. Um, so any questions on the basic three memory types or memory access types in Gem5? No? Okay. So once you understand what are those memory access types, I think it should be pretty easy to now follow that, okay, what should be atomic simple CPU and timing simple CPU. So as I stated earlier, the simple CPU models are single cycle CPU models and inner CPU models. The only difference is in terms of the memory that they are, uh, or the memory accesses they are using. So atomic simple CPU uses atomic memory accesses and timing simple CPU uses timing memory accesses. Any questions? Then we have a more detailed CPU model, um, O3 CPU, which really models an, an out of order pipeline. Uh, the, the pipeline that it is really based on is, I think, is Alpha 21264, which is from 90s. So it's, it's pretty old pipeline or pretty old um, out of order processor, but that's what the Gem 5's out of order CPU is really based on. And it primarily has seven different stages where issue execute write back are all combined in a single stage. But it is very, very configurable. It allows you to model different kind of uh, delays between the stages. Um, and there are a lot of other parameters, basically, which you can configure. Um, any questions on just the, just the basic idea of out of order CPU modeling in Gem5? No, okay. So just to kind of explain you, as I said, that, like it's very configurable. So they are all single cycle uh, CPU models, uh, timing and atomic. Uh, in, in case of atomic, it's like really a single cycle CPU in case of timing because the memory is really modeled through the timing memory accesses. So you can think of there as, uh, again, the actual execution will be a single cycle, but if it's a memory access, then um, that can take more than a cycle. So fundamentally, single stage. Okay, so coming back to the O3 CPU, um, this is just to show you that what are different kind of um, parameters which you can configure. So this is the, the Python um, file for the base O3 CPU. And it, it gives you the idea of all the different kind of configuration parameters that then can be used, that you can configure, and then obviously will be used in the C++ model. So the options are like there are uh, options to basically configure the delay between pipeline stages like rename to fetch delay or decode to fetch delay. You can configure the width of the pipeline. Uh, there are options to configure the um, buffer sizes. Um, finally, it's an out-of-order CPU, so obviously there are options to configure the, the real order buffer size. Um, the reservation station entries in, in, or reservation station in O3 CPU is called instruction queue, and you can again configure the number of entries. You can configure the number of physical registers. 
Um, and I'm assuming you all understand what, um, you, you, you know the basics of out of order CPU, so you know what these things mean. But, and you have the ability to configure all of these, the number of entries and the delays between different stages. Um, any question at this point? Okay. Um, the other kind of detailed CPU model is minor CPU. So minor CPU is um, basically an in-order CPU or in-order pipeline. But in contrast to the timing simple CPU, uh, which is also a detailed memory system modeling, but um, it uses a single cycle CPU, a minor CPU is basically a four stage pipeline. And uh, the stages are fetch one, fetch two, decode, and then um, execute, which really does the execute and write back as well. Uh, the important point uh, I think I want to mention here is, again, you can configure the delay between these stages. Uh, but the names of the stages might be a little bit confusing sometimes because the decode stage is not really decoding anything. It's mostly for bookkeeping. The real decoding is really happening in fetch two stage of uh, minor CPU. So just, to, just wanted to make sure like you, if you're looking at the code, you are not totally confused by it. So uh, the naming might be a little bit off. But yeah, it's very configurable. Again, you can configure the delays between stages, the width as well and usually it uses a scoreboard for, to figure out when um, an instruction can be issued, only if all of its uh, previous, or the things it was dependent on have already been uh, done. So that's minor CPU. Um, and then uh, the other, probably one of the more important um, classes of CPUs that we have in GEM5 is KVM CPU. So, are you familiar with KVM? Like, do you know what's KVM, kernel-based virtual machine? So for those of you who don't know, a very quick uh, introduction, that KVM basically is, is a set of, uh, I would say, is a module in Linux kernel that allows Linux kernel to act as a hypervisor. So basically what you can do with KVM is, in, in case of GEM5, the KVM CP models allow you to kind of bypass GEM5 and run things natively, right? So you can imagine how fast it could be. Um, and, but obviously there are some limitations. Uh, one limitation is that the, the guest ISA has to be the same as the host ISA, right? So ARM would work on ARM host and x86 would work on x86 host. And w at this point we only have support for ARM and x86 KVM CPUs. Okay, so now kind of summarizing everything, uh, Here's the big picture that we saw earlier. So now you can imagine, or you can try to differentiate the characteristics of these CPU models. So obviously KVM CPU models are very, very fast, but don't have any timing information. You can't really model um, a lot of components like branch predictors or caches. Uh, base simple CPU models uh, are fast as well. Um, and they could provide you a lot of timing information, especially if you're using timing simple CPU, but again, they have limitations in terms of the branch predictor effects or the, the real timing of caches, if, for example, using, you're using atomic simple CPU. And finally, the most detailed CPU models, the O3 and minor CPU, they, they, they do modeling at very detail, but uh, they're very slow, right? Because they have to, especially Gem5 follows an execute and execute pipeline model, so it, it's, it's very slow, but generally that brings in some accuracy. Any questions on the differences between CPU models? A very, very uh, quick uh, thing that I wanna point out, we'll talk, into more, talk about more details of this tomorrow, but um, at this point, just to tell you how does a CPU model really interact with other parts of the system. So a CPU model usually uses three interfaces, to access memory, it uses instruction and data ports. Um, and then the uh, interaction with the ISS subsystem is usually through an interface called execution context, and with the rest of the simulator is usually something through something called thread context. Again, you don't have to understand a lot of details at this point. We'll cover most of this tomorrow. Just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, how a CPU model might really interact with other parts of the system. Okay. Now let's move to the more interactive part, which is now we're gonna use some CPU models. And to do that, uh, these are the materials we're going to be using. So in your code spaces, um, 
you can find out the module CPU models, where we're going to have three main things. Uh, the first one is a Python script. It's, uh, here we're going to set up a very simple system with some simple CPU models and using Gem5 standard library. Uh, then we're going, we have a test benchmark that we're going to then run using those CPU models. And finally, we also have the already finished material. If you are uh, lagging behind on something, you can look that up for a reference. So just want to make sure everyone um, has this opened on their systems, right? It is, is everyone there? Okay. Uh, so let's switch to code spaces. So what we're going to do now is that, um, so these are my CPU models. And this is a, a, a boilerplate code that um, where we're going to create a very simple system. So we'll be using um, standard library. So this script actually is one of the, is very similar to one of the examples you used yesterday. So it shouldn't be new to you. But let's type in most of the um, things we want to do. So let's first create a very simple cache hierarchy. Um, oops, okay. And what I'm going to do here is a private L1 cache hierarchy with, um, let's do L1D size. So we are using, um, so it'll be good if, if you can follow me and type all of this in. If you have this from yesterday, maybe you can bring in some of the code if you want, but I'll, I'll suggest that uh, you just follow this because there might be some differences. So, so it's a very simple cache hierarchy, just one, uh, just L1 caches, and we have an L1 instruction cache and a data cache. For the memory itself, again, we're gonna do a very simple, um, sorry, A single channel. All right, these keys. Let's do a single channel DDR3. And the capacity doesn't really matter, but I'm going to do this. Sorry? Uh, L1 I, yeah. Okay. So, so we have our cache and memory. Now let's add a processor. This is where we'll add a CPU model. So we're gonna do a simple processor from the library. And the CPU we're going to be using is from CPU types, let's use the, the most simple uh, CPU atomic. And we're going to be just simulating a single core. Okay. We're going to create a board. Again, a simple board. Oops. And so we'll pass the processor that we just created above. We'll the memory and the cache hierarchy as well as we create it above. Okay. Okay. Yep. All 
Okay, so we have created our board. Uh, as far as the workload or the task branch we're, we're going to run is a little bit different than what you have already done. So we are going to actually add our custom resource because it's a binary that uh, we have, which is not on Gem 5's resources, but is um, we are going to add ourselves. And the path to the binary, so we haven't yet generated it, but uh, let's just write the path and we'll, before running our simulation, we'll uh, create the binary. But the source is in, so the path is using Gem 5. CPU models. So the benchmark we are going to be using is basically an integer um, multiply from LLVM test suite, but uh, I modified it and made it like much smaller so that it, 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 it can run in like very short amount of time, uh, given the time we had for this session. So we have set up the board now. We have passed the actual benchmark we're going to run. Now we're going to use the simulator module. Pass our board. And at this point, we should be able to just run everything. Okay. So does that everyone, is everyone able to do this? Okay, so let's just have a quick review just to make sure we are not missing something. Uh, seems okay. Okay. Okay, now let's first build, before we actually run the simulation, let's first make uh, or build the test binary we have. And so in our materials using gem5, and then if you go to the, the this particular CPU model thing, um, we have integer multiply folder. And all you have to do there, there's a make file, just run make, and you should get the binary. And at this point, um, Let's go back to our, where our script was. So, so I'm going to use gem 5 x 6 binary and then just run it with this uh, script we just created, and as expected, so I'm, I'm probably I'm gonna try to use the full path here. Just make sure the um, the path is correct that you have for your custom resource. Okay, so I just ran that benchmark with Atomic CPU, and you might have seen this, uh, the output being printed, so it's the result of the, uh, some integer multiplication operations. Are you able to run this? Okay, is, um, mm -hmm. Oh, I just updated the path to the, the resource, the benchmark we're trying to use here. Just make sure the your pass either you're running from wherever you're running from the path to the binary from that point is correct, or you can pass um, an absolute path so that you don't have to worry about where exactly the binary is. Um, is everyone able to do this? So if it's done, then we're going to do some quick uh, changes and run few things, and then we're going to look at the stats. So for that, I'm going to go back to these slides, and 
I'm going to tell you what exactly to do, because I think the, the rest of the changes are super simple. Uh, it will be good exercise for you. Okay, so this is the complete system we had. We have just used it to run atomic CPU. Um, one thing that you might, um, I actually did not do, but I'll, I'll ask you to do is, so basically what we're really gonna do is we're going to use, um, we're going to use the same script to run different, run this benchmark with different CPU models and then also with a different cache. So I want you to make sure that whatever stats are generated, you just store them in some backup file or uh, have a separate directory, okay? So you can just rerun whatever you ran with uh, making sure that you used out directory and passed some path to it. Um, as an example, it, I'm calling it atomic normal cache. This is with the, the baseline cache we used and the atomic CPU. So if you did not use a separate folder, so please just rerun one time with this path. And if you all are done, um, we can move forward to the next step. Are you all done? <laughs> Did you all run with atomic CPU? And Okay, let's move to the next thing. So we're gonna change the atomic CPU to more detailed CPUs. First, let's just change atomic to timing. The only difference in your entire script is going to be changing the atomic to timing. So do that, and let's run it again. And making sure that the out directory you have now, you are passing, sorry, you're using specific um, folder name for timing CPU. So if it was atomic normal cache, just call it timing normal cache this time. Mm -hmm. We're just running, not looking at the stats or anything at this point. Are, are you able to run with timing? Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who hasn't yet run this with atomic or timing? So for those who have already run it with timing, also run it with O3 CPU. So just gonna, you're going to change the atomic to O3 or if you already have changed atomic to timing, then change it to O3. Again, have the results in a separate folder. And these are all with the normal cache size. Um, and anyone, okay. So for those of you who have done that, I would suggest do another thing, which is now changing the cache size. So you're gonna now change your cache sizes, which were 32 kilobytes, to much smaller caches, one kilobytes, which is not realistic, but let's do it for the sake of uh, this experiment. So for those of you who have already done with three CPU models, now change the cache size, do the, that thing again, run it again with three CPU models, making sure that the results are again in separate folders. Uh, you can call them atomic small cache, timing small cache, and O3 small cache. So just, um, run with the three CPU models again, but this time with the small cache. Is, mm -hmm. Oh, so the size you're gonna be using is from 32 kilobytes, we are switching down to one kilobyte. So much, much smaller cache. Is, is, is that clear that what are we supposed to do? Okay. So is, is anyone already done with all the runs? There are six runs we're doing with uh, two CPU models and, sorry, two cache sizes and three CPU models. So there are total six runs we have to do. Make sure you have all of them in separate directories. Um, is anyone already done? Okay, getting close. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Uh, three. Atomic, timing, and O3.
Is, is anyone having issues running anything? Oh, so the difference is going to be the cache size. So the normal cache size is 32 oh, kilobytes. You change yeah, it to and that then we change one, one kilobyte. Yeah, exactly, to okay. one kilobyte. Do we also change the after directory for the changes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we do it so that we have all the results in like six different folders. Oh, nice. Yeah. Anyone done with all the six runs? Okay, cool. So um, for those of you who are done, the, the goal basically is to separate the small cache maybe in one folder and the, the normal cache in one folder. And we're gonna look at the, some of the stats and compare across these runs. Um, you can look at the slides and see what exactly that needs to be done, but I'll talk about that in a minute maybe once most of the people are done with the runs. So how many people are done with all six runs? Okay. Uh, just a few. Um, How many of you are done now? <laughs> okay, cool. So for the, um, if, if someone hasn't still been able to run, um, no problem. There are, the results are already in the finished material. You can look at those, but, um, if, and if there's any question in running, we can cover that later as well. So what I'm gonna do now is, um, you can do that as well, or if you don't wanna do it, you can just follow what I have on slides, but uh, the, the main goal is to have, let's say, the small cache runs in one folder and the large cache or the normal cache runs in one folder, and then basically run some grub commands and see some stats and compare them, right? That's the main thing we're going to do. First stat that I want you to look at is the number of simulated operations. Um, uh, I, I want you to just look at or run that command on Linux in wherever you have your results and Tell me, what do you see? Like, what, what, what's, 
how do they compare across CPU models? The same? Should they be the same? Yes? Um, would someone elaborate? <laughs> Same, right? Because, because these, this is just the actual operations that got executed. Doesn't matter what kind of CPU it is. It's going. It's the same program that got executed, right? So exactly, it should be the same operation. Number of cycles. So number of cycles in in the Gem5 stats is basically how many execution cycle or how many cycles Gem5 is telling you that this program will take this CPU that is being modeled. I ran it, this is what, what I got for the comparison across three CPU models. Um, is that expected? This is the number of cycles that Gem5 is telling me that my program would take to execute if run on this, this modeled CPU. Right, O3 is out of order CPU, and the other two are single cycle CPU models. Is, is it expected? Yeah. Right, because, I mean, O3 is a very much more performant CPU, has eight wide pipelines, so can execute eight operations if it's possible. That's expected that it might take much smaller number of cycles to execute the same program, right? Now let's try to compare the execution cycles across the small cache and the normal cache size. And when I did this, I got this, these, these numbers, right? The, the top is the number of cycles for the normal cache, and the bottom is for the smaller cache. So let's start with um, atomic CPU. Let's see how does the atomic CPU compare between the two cache sizes. Um, if you look at the number of cycles, this is the same number of cycles. Doesn't matter the cache size. Um, what do you think, why, what, what's the reason? Hmm? So the question is, if we, ran, or if we run the atomic CPU with the normal cache size and once with the smaller cache size, which is much smaller, the number of cycles that it took to execute the program, which is shown by Gem5, hasn't changed. In fact, it might change a little bit depending on the program. In this case, it's probably the same. Um, so my question is, wh why do you think that's the case? Why, why does the, the change in the cache size have no impact on the uh, execution cycles we are seeing, or the simulated execution cycles we are seeing from Gem5? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one kilobyte is uh, enough cache size for the program? Uh, but it's, if you look at the other CPU models, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. Close, close, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it's not modeling the memory timing in detail, right? Because once you reduce the cache size, you should expect cache misses. So now a lot of requests should go to memory, but atomic CPU doesn't really model those timings in detail. So it doesn't matter if you actually have to access that part of the system a lot, it might not change the results much, right? Um, the, and in case of timing CPU, you can see that there's a big difference. And what's the reason for that? It, it's the same answer, but I, I want again someone to explain that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the timing of the cache misses is simulated, exactly. That's correct answer. So now do you understand the basic of the atomic simple CPU and timing simple CPU, right? Uh, as far as the O3 CPU is concerned, again, once you move to the smaller cache size, the, there is a difference, but still the overall uh, performance that you see of O3 CPU is much better than the timing simple CPU. Uh, it's a separate question or separate thing to look at, but as far as the the mo timing of the mo memory accesses is concerned, O3 also models those, right, and in, in details. So that's why you see for O3 CPU as well, once you move to smaller cache size, there is an impact 
on the simulated number of execution cycles. Is, is that clear? Right? Do you understand the difference between uh, these CPU models? Um, O3 was doing much better than timing CPU then. It's doing still much better than timing CPU, but now it's not doing as, or not doing better than the atomic CPU. Again, mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, So that's a purpose, right? That's what you said, right? So that's a purpose, but um, basically that's the only purpose. Uh, mostly it's used for fast forwarding and warming up caches because as you said, if there are, there are caches, the traffic will go through those, but the timing is not really modeled. So warming up and fast forwarding is really the main case. I, I mean, and the functional testing is the other thing, right? You can use KVM CPU today for functional testing, but for those CPU models where KVM is not supported, for example, RISC-V, you might want to do that in atomic CPU because it's like very fast, runs your simulation very fast. So you can make sure, okay, your program works in Gem5, and now you can run the same thing in a more detailed CPU model, right, for, to get the timing numbers. You can switch CPU, but not switch what? Switch cache. I think you... Uh, you can't switch memory, but you might be able to switch cache itself because memory is really where the architecture state is. Um, but there, but I think depending on the CPU model you are using, there are some limitations like what you can do with caches. I think with Ruby probably you can't. But uh, we can discuss that offline as well. Just remind me. Um, okay, so. Out of order? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the reason is that it's a single cycle CPU. It's not multi timing, but still it can't do, uh, can't execute more than one instruction in a cycle. So that's the limitation. It will never have an IPC value more than one. On the other hand, O3 can have an IPC value more than one, right? So that's the, that's the main reason you, you see this. Uh, okay, so any questions on the timing aspect of the, uh, the CPU models? Um, concludes what I wanted to discuss. Uh, I think there, there are a few other important things that I want you to look at uh, and maybe discuss. Tell me what do you see. I mean, first is the difference in the host seconds. Host seconds are the time that the, the actual machine to, for that session to run, right? So what do you expect? So you can compare and see how do they compare. Um, then there are some stats that you're going to see only in O3, right? Um, so I think during the time, I'll, I'll not discuss that right now, but um, I want you to like have, maybe spend a few time, few minutes. We don't have to discuss right now, but we can discuss later as well. What do you, um, what are your observations on other stats in, the, in, in those stats files? Um, okay, a any questions? Related to these stats that I just talked about, or the the previous the timing differences. Sorry, if you want to do, um, if you want to run. A s mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So I think it really depends on. Um, to what extent do you care about the actual core model, right? Because timing simple CPU is um, is the is still a single. 
it can't have an IPC more than one. So you can only execute one instruction in one uh, cycle. So if you care about that part, you should use all three CPU. If you don't care about that part much, but just care about the memory system, there is not going to be much. And it depends. You might be able to push or stress the memory more with an O3 CPU compared to the timing CPU. So that's the difference you have to take care of. But if you're running many cores, maybe it doesn't matter if it's O3 CPU or timing simple CPU, right? Maybe it's the same impact overall. So it really depends on the, on the use case, but I think you, as long as you consider the fundamentals that what it, at what level the core is being modeled, you can then from that infer, okay, what should be used. Does that answer? I think the because it's faster, right? So the key, yeah, to save time in terms of the simulation, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, if you are not, you don't care about timing at all, you can just run with Atomic, or if you, in your case, KVM is supported, you can run with KVM. Uh, but if you care about timing, then you should go with timing or O3 um, or minor. Uh, but it, 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 again, depends at what level uh, code modeling do you want. Um, so, yeah, I think we are really out of time. I, I can take any questions you have offline. Um, it, does that sound good?